Hey, what's going on guys? Mike from the Rock Collectors. And today we're gonna to take a look at the 10 times Sega let me down with the Sega Dreamcast. The Sega Dreamcast has seen many highs and lows. Its highs were its initial launch in North America, considerably exceeding expectations right out of the gate. An overly exceptional list of launch titles to its slew of outstanding yet quirky games and peripherals that followed its short-lived shelf life. To say the Sega Dreamcast library isn't jam-packed with outstanding first-party and third-party games would be a flat-out lie. With support from Capcom and ports of popular licensed franchises like Tomb Raider and Tony Hawk, and their unbelievable arcade ports, of which outshine the arcade counterparts, the Dreamcast is still lacking two very large third-party companies, EA and Square. Both publishers were doing amazing things. Games like Need for Speed, Tiger Woods, FIFA, Final Fantasy, and countless JRPGs ultimately and would have possibly helped push more units of the Dreamcast in Japan. Albeit technology during the early 2000s was constantly evolving. Even companies years later battled it out with which video format would dominate. Xbox with its HD DVDs versus PlayStation or Sony and their Blu-rays. Sega believed that the cost of the DVD format would not help the console and therefore went down the route of GD-ROM. Though plans for the DVD add-on was in development and quickly axed, as this decision isn't the sole reason the Dreamcast demise, it didn't help that the consumers were looking forward to the future of entertainment centers and wanted a more all-in-one machine. To say the Dreamcast controller is uncomfortable for most would be an understatement. Many feel that it's cramped and has a terrible D-pad and the wire placement is a little bit to be desired. With the Dreamcast adopting many third-person shooters, 3D action adventure platforms, and many games that could use camera changing controls. The Dreamcast needed a controller that had 3D gameplay in mind. The PlayStation 1 already introduced the world to the DualShock. It added to the second analog stick to the then tired standard PlayStation controller and was released nearly two years prior to the Dreamcast's release in North America. So there's no reason why Sega didn't adopt a second analog stick early on in its life cycle. Shenmue was released in North America on November 8, 2000 and quickly captured the hearts of those who played it. Ryo Hazuki's tale of vengeance and mischief to find his father's killer left us North American fans on the cliffhanger that we felt it needed to a resolution. Of all Dreamcast sales, North America's numbers count for more than half of the total Dreamcast sales and Shenmue eventually became the fourth top selling Dreamcast game selling a total of 1.2 million units and the sequel was never brought to the western shores until 2002 on the original Xbox. Albeit a commercial failure, Shenmue 2 should have been on all regions. The Sega Dreamcast launched with a very standard, very white console, but due to its short-lived shelf life, the Dreamcast only seen one secondary color variation in North America, the Sega Sports Black Console. The Black Console looked far better in my opinion. In various regions of the world, Sega released a plethora of limited edition consoles and colors. Unfortunately, we never received those over here. Thank goodness for the aftermarket shell swaps. Although the Dreamcast was discontinued in 2001 in North America, it had a much longer shelf life in Japan. Sega continued to produce games for six more years and not a single port was brought overseas. I understand many games would have required translations and Sega or its publishers may not have the manpower to do some of those translations, and rightfully so. But many of these games were horizontal shooters or fighters and don't require much of a storytelling and few menus to cycle through. Games like Border Down, Chaos Field, Ikaruga, King of Fighters and many Atmos Wave games that were basically running on the Dreamcast already. Sega's gambles with its consoles was a constant issue. The Genesis was a huge success going head to head with the Nintendo and proving that Sega could hold its own. As newer consoles were released, Sega did the unthinkable. Rather than look at its competition and their futures, they instead continued to look at their past, the Genesis, and how they could have marketed it again as a new machine. Fast forward to the Sega Saturn and its success in Japan. It was a major win for Sega. Unfortunately, it lacked more of a global appeal elsewhere in the world. With the announcement and then release of the Dreamcast in Japan, it turned the Japanese market against Sega. The future for the Dreamcast was already onto a rocky start. The Saturn's premature cancellation again burned Sega's fans and the world over. Mario sports titles were pushed to the masses on the N64 and were a way for Mario to appeal to more gamers. Those who like tennis, we got you. Golf, yup, that too. Kart racing, oh yeah. But Sonic never received that sort of treatment. Hey Chip, you okay little buddy? I don't feel too good. 
remember who I am. We received two 3D Sonic games and one lackluster Mario Party knockoff. Being that the Dreamcast never really had a chance to take off, I can let this slide. As a Dreamcast collector, a minor gripe of mine is that the GD-ROMs are magnets to scratches. Similar to music CDs, you set a CD down and you pick up a scratch. Fortunately, the polymer developed by TDK wasn't available until the rise of Blu-rays. But unfortunately, the Dreamcast laser was too weak not to be affected by these scratches. Mini consoles, albeit a novelty, Nintendo's release of the NES SNES Mini really showcased the forward innovation that Nintendo was marketing. The only issue I had with most mini consoles was the choices of games. Many choices were a bit on the same old, same old side, meaning same rehashes of the same games we've seen on many past Nintendo consoles. When these were announced, Sega fans drooled at the thought of a new Sega console maybe a Master System or a Saturn Mini or Dare I Dream a Dreamcast Mini. The perfect opportunity for Dreamcast Mini release in North America would have been the 20th anniversary of the launch of the Dreamcast in North America. Instead, Sega decided to create the Game Gear Mini. Now with the Dreamcast being only on the shelves for two years in North America, there were still many opportunities that Sega could have looked and forecasted forward and made the understanding of what they were mistakenly looking at. Instead of concentrating on what the console needs now, they were more concerned of what we can add to the console later. The second analog stick, DVD support, were just to name a few of some of the many mistakes that Sega made on the Dreamcast. In those two years, Sega could not climb out of the hole that they've already dug themselves. And that's unfortunate for Dreamcast fans. Which do you think is Sega's biggest blunder when it came to the Dreamcast? Something that they should have done and would have changed Sega's fortune for the better. Please let me know in the comments down below. Please like, comment, subscribe. Thanks guys.